The Columbia Broadcasting System and its associated stations present Orson Welles and the Mercury Theater on the air. Tonight, for the 20th broadcast in this series of great narratives, dramatized, produced, and directed by Orson Welles, we turn again to one of the classics of the last century, The Pickwick Papers by Charles Dickens. Orson Welles and the Mercury Theater on the air in The Pickwick Papers, starring Orson Welles as Alfred Jingle and Sergeant Buzz Fuzz. <laughs> May the 12th, 1827, in special session of the Corresponding Society of the Pickwick Club, Samuel Pickwick, Chairman, presiding, unanimously resolved that the first expedition of the Society be devoted to the study of the habits and customs of the landed gentry of southern England, in pursuance of which places are to be reserved on a Commodore coach bound from Golden Cross to Rochester, whence the party will proceed by carriage to the manor of Dingley Dell in the county of Suffolk, England. Signed, Samuel Pickwick, permanent chairman. Nathaniel Winkle, permanent vice chairman. Tracy Tupman, permanent honorary treasurer. Augustus Snodgrass, permanent secretary. Bright and still was the day, balmy the air, and beautiful the appearance of every object as our illustrious chairman rose from his bed in Goswell Street and proceeded to put himself into his clothes and his clothes into his portmanteau. As he sat down to breakfast, a casual observer might possibly have remarked nothing extraordinary in the bald head and circular spectacles which were intensely turned towards the griddled kidney that lay on the plate before him. To those who knew that the gigantic brain of Pickwick was working beneath that forehead, and that the beaming eyes of Pickwick were twinkling behind those glasses, the sight was indeed an interesting one. And how much more interesting did the spectacle become when, starting into full life and animation, he rose from the table, seized his portmanteau, inserted a telescope in his greatcoat pocket and a notebook in his waistcoat, and bade a hearty farewell to Mrs. Bardell, his landlady, and started for the street. Six minutes later, he reached the Golden Cross. Bless me, that's our coat. It's me, Mr. Pickwick, this way. Hurry there, hurry, Mr. Pickwick. Oh, Mr. Pickwick, Mr. Pickwick. Hey, there, my portmanteau, my portmanteau. Already seated in the coach was a tall, thin young man in a shiny green coat. It was buttoned closely up to his chin, and no old stock without a vestige of shirt ornamented his throat. His face was thin and haggard. Welcome, gentlemen. Welcome. Entirely welcome. Charming company. Pleasant journey. Lots of room. Brown paper parcel here. That's all. Other luggage gone by water. Packing cases nailed up. Big hey, pounders. Heavy, heavy. Idiot. Blasted heavy. A moment later, we came out under the low archway which formed the entrance to Hoban Bridge. Yes, sir. That's right. Take care of your heads. Terrible place, this. Dangerous work. Other day, five children. Mother, tall lady, eating sandwiches. Forgot the arch. Crash. Knock. Children look around. Mother's head off. Sandwich in her hand. No mouth to put it in. Head of a family off. Shocking. Shocking. Makes you think, eh, sir? Glad to meet you. Name is Jingle. Alfred Jingle. Yours, sir? Uh, Samuel Pickwick, sir. Uh, philosopher, sir? An observer of human nature, ah, sir. Ah, so am I. So am I. Most people are when they have little to do and less to get. Poet, sir? But my friend, Mr. Augustus Snodgrass here, has a Strong poetic turn. Ah, so have I. Epic poem. Ten thousand lines. Revolution of July. Composed on the spot. Mars by day. Apollo by night. Bang the field piece. Twang the lyre. You were present at that glorious scene, sir. Present? Snodgrass? Think I was. Fired a musket. Fired with an idea. Rushed into wine shop. Wrote it down. Back again. Whiz. Bang. Another idea. Wine shop again.
again, pen and ink, back again, cut and slash, noble time, sir. Sportsman, Mr. Pickwick? Uh, my friend, Mr. Nathaniel Winkle here, is a famous sportsman. Fine pursuit, sir, fine pursuit. Dog, sir? Uh, not just now. Ah, you should keep dogs, Winkle. Fine animals, sagacious creatures, dog of me own once. Point a surprising instinct, out shooting one day, entering enclosure, whistle, dog stop, whistled again, ponto... No go. Stock still. Call it again. Ponto? Ponto? Wouldn't move. Dog transfixed. Staring at the board. Looked up. Saw an inscription. Gamekeeper has orders to shoot all dogs found in his enclosure. Wouldn't pass it. Wonderful dog. Valuable dog. That's a very... Singular circumstance, that, Mr. Jingle. Uh, will you allow me to make a note of it? Certainly, sir. Certainly. A hundred more anecdotes. The same animal. A uh, fine girl in that carriage, sir. Do you uh, favor the sex, sir? Uh, Mr. Tracy Tupman here. Oh, Mr. Jingle. Irresistible creatures. English girls, Tupman, not so fine as Spanish. Noble creatures, Spanish girls. Jet hair, black eyes, lovely forms. Sweet creatures, beautiful. You've been in Spain, sir. Lived there, lived there, ages. Uh, many conquests, sir. Conquests, thousands, thousands. Don Bellaro Fisgi, grandee, only daughter, Donna Christina, splendid creature, love me to distraction, jealous father, high souled daughter, handsome Englishman, Donna Christina in despair, prussic acid, stomach pump in my portmanteau, operation performed, old Bellaro in ecstasies. Consent to our union, join hands and flood of tears. Romantic story, very... Is the lady in England now, sir? Dead, sir, dead. Never recovered the stomach pump. Undermined constitution, fell a victim. And her father? Remorse and misery, sudden disappearance, talk of the whole city, search made everywhere without success, public fart in the great square suddenly ceased playing, weeks elapsed, still a stoppage, workman employed to clean it, water drawn off, father-in-law discovered sticking head first in the main pipe with full confession in his right boot, took it out, and the fart and fade away again as well as ever. Uh, will you allow me to milk that little romance down, Certainly. Sir? Yes, sir, certainly. Fifty more if you'd like to hear them. Strange life, sir, mine. Rather curious history. Not extraordinary, but singular. Very singular. We slept that night at the Bully Inn at Rochester. Next morning, there was no sign of our new acquaintance. After breakfast, Mr. Pickwick called to order a special meeting of the Corresponding Society of the Pickwick Club. Mr. Pickwick rose and slowly mounted into the Windsor chair on which he had been previously seated. What a study for an artist did that moment present. There stood the illustrious Pickwick, with one hand gracefully concealed behind his coattails and the other waving in the air to assist his glowing declamation. His elevated position revealed those pipes and gaiters which, had they clothed an ordinary man, might have passed without observation, but uh, which, when Pickwick wore them, inspired universal awe and respect. Same gentleman is dear to the heart of every man. Here, yeah, yeah. Poetic fame is dear to the heart of my friend Snodgrass. The fame of conquest is equally dear to my friend Tupman, and the desire for earning fame in the sports of the field, the air and the water, is uppermost in the breast of my friend Winkle. I will not deny, gentlemen, that I have been influenced by human passions and human feelings. Cheers. Possibly by human weaknesses. Loud cries of no. I, sir, am an humble individual. Cries of no, no. Still, I cannot but feel that in electing me as your leader, you have selected me for a service of great honor and some danger. Traveling is in a troubled state, and the minds of coachmen are unsettled. Look abroad, gentlemen, and contemplate the scenes which are enacting around you. Stagecoaches are upsetting in all directions. Horses are bolting, boats are overturning, and boilers are bursting. Will these things daunt us, gentlemen? Members of the Pickwick Society? Cries of nerve. Will these perils deter us from prosecuting to their glorious consternation? Those researches in the cause of science and learning, to which as members of this club, we stand pledged? Cries of no, no, never. Gentlemen, I have your answer. I thank you. Loud cheers, meeting adjourned. <laughs> It was late in the afternoon when we reached Dingley Dell. On the doorstep stood our host, Mr. Wardle. Beside him stood an enormous red-faced boy with his eyes closed. Hey there! Hello! 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 Why, where have you been? We've been waiting for you all day. Well, you do look tired. Not hurt, I hope, eh? No? Well, I'm glad to hear that. Very, very glad to be sure. Joe! Wake up, Joe! Yes, sir. Let down the steps of the gentleman's stage. <sighs> Uh, our friend Winkle had a little trouble. Unusually large horse. Spilled, eh, Mr. Winkle? Never mind. Common accident in these parts. 
Joe, blast that boy. He's gone to sleep again. Hey, Joe, Joe. Oh, well, gentlemen, we'll soon have you put to rights. This way, this way, welcome to Dingley Hall. Joe, Joe. Well, I'll be blown if that boy hasn't fallen asleep again. A number of persons who were assembled in the parlor rose to greet Mr. Pickwick and his friends upon our entrance. Two young ladies still in their teens. My daughters, gentlemen, my gals, these are Isabel and Emily, and that's my sister, Miss Rachel Wardle. She's a miss, she is, and yet she ain't a miss, eh, sir? Hey, Rachel? No, brother. My sister, Miss Pickwick. How do you do? Mr. Snodgrass, my sister Rachel. How do you do? Mr. Winkle. How do you do? And Mr. Tupman, my sister Rachel. How do you do, Mr. Tupman? Charmed to make your acquaintance, ma'am. In the post of honor in the right-hand corner of the chimney piece sat a very old lady with an ear trumpet in one hand and an orange in the other. Mr. Pickwick, mother! Hmm? I can't hear you! Mr. Pickwick, mother! Oh, well, it don't matter. He don't care for an old woman like me, I dare say. I assure you, ma'am, that nothing delights me more than to see a lady of your time of life leading so fine a family and looking so fine and well. Mm, It's all very fine, I dare say, but I cannot hear him. Not a word, not a word. At the vast dinner table that night, Mrs. Wardle occupied one end of the table. At the other end sat Mr. Wardle and Mr. Winkle, myself between the two girls. And on the other side, Miss Rachel Wardle and Mr. Tucker. Do you think my niece is pretty, Mr. Tuckman? Oh, I should if their aunt wasn't here. <laughs> you naughty man. But really, if their complexions were a little better, don't you think they'd be nice-looking girls by candlelight? Oh, yes, I think they would. Oh, you quiz. I know what you were going to say. What, ma'am? You were going to say that Isabel stoops. I know you were. You men are such observers. Well, so she does. It can't be denied. I often tell her that when she gets a little older, she'll be quite frightful. Well, you are a quiz. What a sarcastic smile you have, Mr. Tuckman. I declare I'm quite afraid of you. Afraid of me, ma'am? Oh, you can't disguise anything from me. I know what that smile means very well. What, ma'am? You mean that you don't think Isabel stooping is as bad as Emily's boldness. Well, she is bold. You cannot think how wretched it makes me sometimes. I'm sure I cry about it for hours together. Oh, Mr. Tupman, I know what you're thinking now. Oh, oh. Joe, Joe, wake up, Joe. Oh, Mr. Stardgrass, you're closest to him. Be good enough to pinch him, sir, in the leg, if you please. Nothing quite else quite wakes him up. Oh, oh thank you. Oh, Joe, open another bottle of wine and pass the gentleman. Joe! Yes, sir. Are you awake? Yes, sir. Blast the boy. Very extraordinary boy, that. Does he always sleep in this way? Sleep? Pickwick, he's always asleep. Goes on errands asleep and snores as he cleans the silver. Oh, very odd. Odd indeed. I'm proud of that boy. Wouldn't part with him on any account. He's a natural curiosity. Dear Joe, wake up, Joe! Next morning, when our chairman awoke, the rich, sweet smell of the hayricks rose to his chamber window, and all around he heard the birds singing. Hello! Hey, Pickwick! Hello! How are you? Wardle! Is that you? I'm out in the garden. Beautiful morning. Make haste. Come down. Come out. I say! Yes? What's going on? What are you doing with that gun under your arm? Why, your friend, Mr. Winkle, and I are going rook shooting before breakfast. He's a very good shot, aren't he? I've heard him say he's a capital one. I admit I never saw him aim at anything. Now then, all ready, Winkle? I say, uh, wait a minute. What are those boys doing climbing those trees? (laughs) Only to stop the game. You what? Why, in plain English, Mr. Tupman, to frighten the rooks. Oh, is that all? 
Very well. Shall I begin, Mr. Wiggles? If you please. Stand aside, then. Now for it. Oh, hey, you got one, sir. Take him up, Joe. Now, Winkle, your turn. By the way. Ross, is my gun misfired? Odd. I never knew one of my guns to misfire before. Let me see it. Why, why, I don't see anything of the cap. Oh, bless my soul. I declare I forgot the cap. Well, here you are. Here's the cap. Try again. Now ready. All right, boys. Oh! What's wrong? Oh, good heavens. What happened? Uh, I'm not sure, Mr. Wattle, but I think I've just killed Mr. Tupman. The surgeon came. Mr. Tupman's arm was examined, the wound dressed, and pronounced to be a very slight one. And now it is evening at Dingley Dell. Leaving Mr. Tupman to the care of the ladies, Mr. Wardle, Mr. Pickwick, and the rest of us had gone to the cricket match at Muggleton. Isabel and Emily had strolled out. But this old lady had fallen asleep in her chair. From the distant kitchen penetrated the low and monotonous sound of the fat boy. Mr. Tupman. Miss Wardle. You are an angel. Mr. Tupman. Nay, I know it but too well. All women are angels, they say. Then what can you be? Or to what, without presumption, can I compare you, Miss Wardle? There was a woman I've ever seen who resembled you. Where else could I hope to find so rare a combination of excellence and beauty? Where else could I see? Men are such deceivers. Oh, they are, they are. But not all men. There lives at least one being who can never change. One being who would be content to devote his whole existence to your happiness. Who lives but in your eyes. Who breathes but in your smiles. Who bears the heavy burden of life itself. Only for you, Miss Wardle. Could such an individual be found? Ah, but he can be found. He is found. He is here, Miss Wardle. On his knees at your feet. Mr. Tupman, right. Never. Oh, Rachel. Rachel. Oh, oh. oh Rachel. Say you love me. Mr. Tupman, I can hardly speak the words, but, but you are not entirely indifferent to me. Oh, Rachel. Shh. Is this Wardle? Is this Wardle? Oh, Chris. What is it, Joe? Oh, Mrs. Now, Joe, I'm sure I've always been a good mistress to you, Joe. You've invariably been treated very kindly. You've never had too much to do, and you've always had enough to eat. I know he has. But, oh, missus. Then what can you want to do now? I wants to make your flesh creep. <gasps> what do you think I see in the arbor just now? This is what? The strange gentleman, him as at his armor, a kissing and a hugging. Oh, Joe. None of the servants, I hope. Worse than that. Look, one of my granddaughters. Worse than that. Worse than that? Who was it, Joe? Miss Rachel. What? The daughter? Miss Rachel. My daughter? And she suffered it? Yes, ma'am, and what's more, I see her a-kissing of him again. Oh! Ten. Eleven. Twelve. Well, twelve o'clock had struck, and the gentleman had not returned from the cricket match. Consternation reigned at Dingley Dell. Uh, 
Early next morning, Mr. Jingle arose. Since none else in the house was about at that hour, he had the honour of breakfasting alone with Mrs. Wardle. Of what transpired between them, nothing is known. But this much is known, that later that morning, finding the door to the parlour partially open, he peeped in. Uh, Miss Rachel, forgive intrusion, short acquaintance, no time for ceremony. All discovered. Sir? Hush. Large boy, dumpling face, round eyes, Joe, treacherous dog, overheard everything. Told the old lady, old lady furious, wild, raving, Arbor Tupman, kissing and hugging, all that sort of thing, eh, ma'am, eh? Mr. Jingle, if you have come here, sir, please do Not at all, by no means. Old lady told me over scrambled eggs, came to warn you of your danger, tender services, prevent the hubbub. Never mind, think it an insult, leave the room. Oh, dear, what shall I do? My brother will be furious. Of course he will, outrageous. Oh, Mr. Jingle, what can I say? Being dreamt it, nothing more easy. Blackguard boy, lovely woman, fat boy, horse whipped, you believed, end of matter, or comfortable. Oh. You seem unhappy, Mr. Jingle. May I not inquire into the cause? Oh, uh, unhappy cause and your love bestowed upon a man who is insensible to the blessing of even now. But no, he is my friend. I will not expose his vices. Miss Wardle, farewell. Say, Mr. Jingle, you have made an allusion to Mr. Tupman. Explain it. Never, never. Mr. Jingle, I entreat. I implore you, if there is anything dreadful mystery connected with Mr. Tupman, I'll reveal it. Can I... Can I see lovely creatures, sacrifice to the shrine, heartless avarice? Tupman, madam, only wants your money. Oh, Mr. Wardle! Mr. Wardle, they've gone. What are you talking about? They've gone, master. Gone right clean off, sir. Who's gone? Are you out of your head, boy? That's a jingle and Miss Rachel. Off to London to get married, they said. The scoundrel. They let in a poche. Where's this morning they did from Blue Lion, Muggleton. I was there, Mr. Wardle, but I couldn't stop him, so I, I ran off to Teddy. Good Lord, what should we do? Do? Joe, where's the gate? The gate. I'll the get gate. a gate for the lion, I'll follow them. I'll go with you. You're a good fellow, Pickwick. Are you ready? I'm ready. All right, here's the gate, sir. Ready to go. Come on, Pickwick. We'll catch him this side of London, or we'll break our next flying. <laughs> Place of yours, my friend. If you'd sent word you was a coming, we'd had it repaired. Hey, the fact of the matter is that if you'll stop polishing those boots for a minute and answer our questions, you won't regret it. Won't regret it, eh? We want to know who you got stopping here at present. Who we got stopping here? Well, there's a wooden leg in number six. There's a pair of Essians in 13. There's two pair of half shoes in the commercial. There's easier painted tops in the snuggery inside the bar. And five more tops in a coffee room. Nothing more. Hey, stop a bit. Yes, there's a pair of Wellingtons, a good deal more, and a pair of ladies' shoes in number five. Come in less than an hour ago. What sort of shoes? Country, mate. Any maker's name? Bran. Where else? Muggleton. Muggleton? It is them. Pick quick, we've found them. Hey, easy there. The Wellingtons went out half hour ago. The doctor's commons. Come back with a license. With a license? Then we're just in time. Come on. Show us the room, Boots. Uh, Veller's the name, sir. Sam Veller. Well, here's a sovereign, Weller. You see this? I do, sir. Show us into that room at once without announcing us, and it's yours. Understand? Right to the trivet. This way, gentlemen. What is it? It's me. Open the door. Open the door, Rachel. We break it in. Oh! Oh! You're a nice scoundrel, aren't you, Jingle? I'll have you prosecuted, indicted. I'll, I'll, I'll ruin you. 
You hear? And you, Rachel, at a time of life when you ought to know better. What do you mean by running away with a vagabond, disgracing your family, and making yourself miserable? Get on your bonnet, quickly. Do nothing of the kind, my dear, nothing of the kind. Leave the room, sir. No business here. Lady Street X, she pleases. More than one and twenty. More than one and twenty, more than one and forty. I'm not! You are. You're fifty if you're an hour. Oh! As to you, Tingle, I've a good mind to break every bone in your body. Idle threats, sir. Idle threats, impetuous nature. Mr. Wardle, you and I, men of the world, one thing another. Do sit down, sir. Humble lodgings. Talk it over. Prone con. Surely, Mr. No Wardle. compromise with the likes of you, sir. Uh, one moment, Pickwick. Mr. Jingle, how much will you take? Fifty pounds? It won't do. Not half enough. Think it over. There's a great deal to be done with fifty pounds, my dear sir. More to be done with 150. Won't waste time in splitting straws. Say, say, seventy. Won't do. Sorry. Eighty. I'll write you a check at once. Won't do. Will you tell me what will do? Expense of affair, this, sir. Expense of affair. Money out of pocket. Posting, nine pounds. License, three. That's twelve. Compensation, a hundred. A hundred and twelve. Breach of honor and uh, loss of lady. Yes, yes. Never mind the loss. Say a hundred. Come. And twenty. Come, come. I'll write you a check. I'll make it payable the day after tomorrow. And we can get her away meanwhile. I'm writing you a check for a hundred pounds. A hundred and twenty. Very well, then. One hundred and twenty. Here you are. And mind you, Pickwick, that nothing should have induced me to make this compromise, not even regard for my family, if I hadn't known that the moment this man gets any money in that pocket of his, he'll go to the devil faster if possible than he would without it. And now, sir, will you leave this house? Off directly. Bye-bye, Wardle. Bye-bye, Pickwick. Here's the license. Get the name altered. Take home the lady. Do for Tupman. <laughs> CBS and its affiliated stations are presenting Orson Welles and the Mercury Theater on the air in an original dramatization of Charles Dickens' Pickwick Papers. We pause a moment now for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Charles Dickens' Pickwick Papers, brought to you by the Mercury Theater on the air and starring Orson Welles as Alfred Jingle and Sergeant Buzzfuzz. August the 25th, 1827. Mr. Pickwick's apartments in Goswell Street, although on a limited scale, were particularly adapted for the residence of a man of our chairman's genius and observation. There were no children in the house, no servants, no fowls. His landlady, Mrs. Bardell, the widow and sole executrix of a deceased customs house officer, was a comely woman of bustling manners and agreeable appearance. The infantine sports and the gymnastic exercises of Master Bardell, her son, aged ten, who were exclusively confined to the neighboring uh, pavements and gutters. Cleanliness and quiet reigned throughout the house, and in it the will of Mr. Pickwick, our chairman, was law. Mrs. Uh, Bardell? Mrs. Bardell? Sir? Your little boy is a very long time going. It's over an hour since I sent him out. Why, it's a good long way to the White Hart Inn, sir. A good two miles. Ah, very true, so it is. Uh, <clears throat> uh, Mrs. Bardell. Sir? Uh, Mrs. Bardell, do you think it a much greater expense to keep two people than to keep one? No, Mr. Pickwick, what a question. Well, but do you, Mrs. Bardell? Mm, that depends. That depends a good deal upon the person, you know, Mr. Pickwick, and whether it's a saving and careful person, sir. That, that's very true. But the person I have in my eye, uh, Mrs. Bardell, I think possesses these qualities and has, moreover, a considerable knowledge of the world and a great deal of sharpness. Mrs. Bardell, which may be of material use to me. No. Mr. Pickwick. To tell you the truth, Mrs. Bardell, I have made up my mind. Dear me, sir. You will think it very strange now that I ever consulted you about the matter and never even mentioned it till I sent your little boy out this morning, eh? Well, what do you think, Mrs. Bardell? Oh, Mr. Pickwick, 
You're very kind, sir. <laughs> it will save you a good deal of trouble, won't it? Oh, I never thought anything of the trouble, sir. And of course, I should take more trouble to please you then than ever. But it is so kind of you, Mr. Pickwick, to have so much consideration for my loneliness. Oh, to be sure. I never thought of that. When I'm in town, you'll always have somebody to sit with you. To be sure, so you will. I'm sure I ought to be a very happy woman. And your little boy. Mrs. is Art. He too will have a companion, a lively one, who'll teach him how to be bound more tricks in a week than he would ever learn in a year. Oh, you dear. Oh, you kind, good, playful dear. Mrs. Barlow. Oh, you darling. Oh, Mrs. Barlow, what are you doing? Oh, Mrs. Bottle, your arms, your your choking oh, me. Dear, dear, oh, dear, bless my soul, Mrs. Oh, Bottle, my good woman. Oh dear me, what a situation! Pray consider, please, Mrs. Bottle, don't if anybody should come. Oh, let oh. them come! I'll oh. never leave you, you dear, good, kind. Oh, oh Mr. Bottle, let me go with you. I oh, hear somebody dear, coming up the stairs. Don't, don't. There's a good creature. Don't, don't. Oh, great heavens! Well, for oh, heaven's sake, uh, gentlemen, uh, why? What's the matter? I don't know. Uh, it, Stop staring, Snodgrass. Topman Winkle, come here. Help me. Let's lead this woman downstairs. Oh, I'm better now, Mr. Pickwick. Let me lead you downstairs, ma'am. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you. I'll go by myself. I'd rather go by myself. Oh. Mr. Pickwick. Dear Mr. Pickwick. Oh. I cannot conceive, gentlemen. I cannot conceive what has been the matter with that woman. I was merely trying to announce to her my intention of hiring a manservant when she fell into the extraordinary paroxysm in which you found her. Very, very extraordinary thing. Very. 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 Placed me in such an extraordinarily awkward situation. Very. 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 Gentlemen. Fellow members. Surely you don't suspect me. There's a man at the door now. It's the man I spoke to you about. A most <laughs> remarkable fellow. I sent for him up at the White Hart Inn this morning. Come in. Good morning, gentlemen. Uh, gentlemen, this is Mr. Weller, Sam Weller. You remember me, I suppose? From the White Hart? <laughs> I should think so. Queer customer, that uh, Jingle. But he was one too many for you, wasn't he? Up to snuff and a pinch or two over, right? Uh, never mind that matter now. I want to speak to you about something else. Sit down. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Business first and pleasure afterwards, as King Richard the Third said when he stabbed Tyler King in the tower before he smothered the baby. Now, with regard to the matter on which I sent for you, Mr. Weller. That's the point, sir. Uh, is it? As the father said to the child when he swallowed a nightmare. <clears throat> uh, we want to know in the first place whether you have any reason to be discontented with your present situation. Before I answer that dear question, gentlemen, I should like to know, in the first place, whether you're going to provide me with a better. I have half a mind to engage you myself. Have you, though? Wages? Twelve pounds a year. Clothes? Two suits? Work? To attend upon me and travel about with me and these gentlemen here. Do you accept the situation? The terms is agreed on. I'm wrecked to a strange gentleman. And if the clothes fix me off as well as the place, they'll do. Take a bill, Dan. And so, before the night had closed in, Mr. Weller was furnished with a grey coat uh, with our Pickwick Club button, a black hat with a cockade to it, a pink striped waistcoat, Light breeches and gaiters and a variety of other necessaries were too numerous to recapitulate. Mr. Weller regarded himself in the mirror. <laughs> well, if my father could see me there, I don't know whether I meant to be a footman or a groom or a gamekeeper or a seedsman. He looks like a sort of compo of every one on him. Never mind. There's change of air, plenty to see and little to do. And all this suits my complaint and common will. So long life to the picnic. The next morning, led by Mr. Pickwick and accompanied by his new servant, the three active members of the illustrious Pickwick Club climbed upon the upper seat of the Bristol coach, little suspecting how thickly the clouds were at that moment gathering about the head of their illustrious chairman, 
Three days later, whilst they sat at breakfast in the tap room of the George and Vulture, the storm broke. Who is it? I, I say, sir, this is a private room, sir, a private room. No room's private to his majesty when the street doors once passed. That's the law. Some people maintain that an Englishman's house is his castle. That's gammon. Hey, yeah, young fellow, it's my opinion that you're coming in a great deal too strong. There's a mail coachman said to the snowstorm when it overtook him. Quiet, you. Which one of you is Mr. Pickwick? My name's Pickwick. My name's Law. Wh- what? Law, civil power, and executive. Same as me title. There's me authority. In the name of the peace of our suffering Lord the King, studied on that case, made and provided, and all regular, in pursuance of which I deliver to you, Pickwick, this communication. What do you mean by this insolence? Leave the room, sir. That I will and gladly, sir. No offense taken, I hope, where none men. Good day, gentlemen. On the table before our chairman lay a paper, neatly sealed with a wafer, and directed in a round hand, Mr. Pickwick picked it up and opened it. Oh! Oh, mercy on us. What's this? It must be a jest. It... It can't be true. What is it? What's the matter? Nobody dead, is there? Oh, Chapman, you read it. Yes. Freeman's Court, Cornhill, August 28th, 1830. Bartle against Pickwick, sir. Having been instructed by Mrs. Martha Bartle, landlady of 28 Goswell Street, to commence an action against you for a breach of promise of marriage for which the plaintiff lays her damages at 1,500 pounds, we beg to inform you that a writ has been issued against you in this suit in the Court of Common Pleas. We are, sir, your obedient servants, Godson and Fogg. It's... it's a plot. Yes, it is a plot, gentlemen. A vile attempt to extort money. A base conspiracy. Sergeant Buzzfuzz. Uh, uh, I am for the plaintiff, Lord. Who is with you, Brother Buzzfuzz? Uh, Mr. Simpkins, sir. Uh, rise, Mr. Simpkins. Sergeant Snubbin. I appear for the defendant, my lord. Anybody with you, Brother Snubbin? Mr. Funky, my lord. Sergeant Buzzfuzz and Mr. Skimkin for the plaintiff. For the defendant, Sergeant Snubbin and Mr. Monkey. I beg your lordship's pardon, Funky. Oh, very good. Go on. Sergeant Buzzfuzz, you open the case. I do, my lord. My lord, gentlemen of the jury, never, never from the very first moment of my applying myself to the study and practice of the law have I approached a case with feelings of such deep emotion or with such a heavy sense of the responsibility imposed upon me, a responsibility which I could never have supported were it not buoyed up and sustained by a conviction so strong as to amount to a positive certainty that the case of truth and justice must prevail with a high-minded and intelligent dozen of men whom I now see in that box before me. This is an action, gentlemen, for a breach of promise of marriage in which the damages are laid at 1,500 pounds. The plaintiff, gentlemen... Is a widow. Yes, gentlemen, a widow. Her name is Mrs. Bartle. The late Mr. Bartle, after enjoying for many years the esteem and confidence of his sovereign, as one of the guardians of his royal revenues, glided almost imperceptibly from the world to seek elsewhere for that repose and peace which a custom house can never afford. Sometime before his death, He had stamped his likeness upon a little boy. With this little boy, the only pledge of her departed excitement, Mrs. Bartle shrunk from the world and courted the retirement and tranquility of Goswell Street. And here, she placed in her front parlor window a written placard bearing the inscription, Apartments furnished for a single gentleman... Inquire within. I entreat the attention of the jury to the wording of this document. Apartments furnished 
for a single gentleman. Mrs. Bartle's opinions of the opposite sex gentlemen were derived from a long contemplation of the inestimable qualities of her lost husband. She had no fear. She had no distrust. She had no suspicion. All was confidence and reliance. Mr. Bartle, said the widow, Mr. Bartle was once a single gentleman himself. To single gentlemen, I look for protection, for assistance, for comfort, and for consolation. In single gentlemen, I shall perpetually see something to remind me of what Mr. Bartle was when he first won my young and untried affections. To a single gentleman, then, shall my lodgings be let. Actuated by this beautiful and touching impulse, the lonely and desolate widow dried her tears, furnished her first floor, caught the innocent boy to her maternal bosom, and put the bill up in her parlor window. Did it remain there long? No. No, the serpent was on the watch. The train was laid. The mine was preparing the sapper and miner were at work. Before the bill had been in the parlor window, three days, three days, gentlemen, a being erect upon two legs and bearing all the outward semblance of a man and not a monster knocked at the door of Mrs. Bartle's house. He inquired within. He took the lodgings. And on the very next day, he entered into possession of them. This man was Pickwick. Pickwick, the defendant. Of this man, Pickwick, I will say little. The subject presents but a few attractions. And I, gentlemen, am not the man, nor are you, gentlemen, the men to delight in the contemplation of revolting heartlessness and of systematic villainy. I say systematic villainy, gentlemen. And when I say systematic villainy, let me tell the defendant Pickwick, if he be in court, as I am informed he is, and that it would have been more decent in him, more becoming in better judgment and in better taste, if he had stopped away, let me tell him, gentlemen, that any gestures of dissent in which he may indulge in this court will not go down with you. But will you know how to value and how to appreciate them? Be his name Pickwick or Noakes or Stokes or Stiles or Brown or Thompson. I shall show you, gentlemen, that for two years, Pickwick continued to reside constantly and without interruption or intermission at Mrs. Bartle's house. I shall show you that Mrs. Bartle, during the whole of that time, waited on him, attended to his comforts. I shall show you that. And I shall show you that on many occasions, he gave halfpence and on some occasions even six months to a little boy. I shall prove to you, gentlemen that on August 25th of last year, he distinctly and in terms offered a marriage. And I am in a situation to prove to you on the testimony of three of his own friends, most unwilling witnesses, gentlemen, most unwilling witnesses, that on that morning he was discovered by them holding the plaintiff in his arms and soothing her agitation by his caresses and endearments. Now, gentlemen, put one word more. Two letters that pass between these parties, letters which are admitted to be in the handwriting of the defendant and which speak volumes indeed. They are not open, fervent, eloquent epistles, breathing nothing but the language of affectionate attachment. No, they are covered, sly, Underhanded communications, let me read the first. Garraway's, 12 o'clock. Dear Mrs. B., chops and tomato sauce, yours, Pickwick. Gentlemen, what does this mean? 
chops and tomato sauce. Yours. Thick with chops. Gracious heavens and tomato sauce. Gentlemen, is this the happiness of a sensitive and confiding female to be trifled by such shallow artifices as these? The next has no date whatever, which is in itself suspicious. Dear Mrs. B., I shall not be at home till tomorrow. Slow coach, and then follows this very remarkable expression. Don't trouble yourself about the warming pan. The warming pan. Why, gentlemen, who does trouble himself about a warming pan? When was the peace of mind of man or woman broken or disturbed by a warming pan, which is in itself a harmless, a useful, and I will add, gentlemen, a comforting article of furniture. Why is Mrs. Bartle so earnestly entreated not to agitate herself about this warming pan unless, as is no doubt the case, it is a mere cover for hidden fire, a mere substitute for some endearing word or promise agreeably to a preconcerted system of correspondence artfully contrived by Pickwick with a view to his contemplated desertion and which I am not in a condition to explain. But not of this, gentlemen. It is difficult to smile with an aching heart. It is ill-jesting when our deepest sympathies are awakened. My client's hopes and prospects are ruined, but pick quick, gentlemen, pick quick, the ruthless destroyer of this domestic oasis in the desert of Goswell Street, pick quick, who has choked up the well and thrown ashes on the sward, pick quick, who comes before you today with his heartless tomato sauce and warming pans. Pickwick still rears his head with unblushing effrontery and gazes without a sigh on the ruin he has made. Damages. Damages, gentlemen. Heavy damages is the only punishment with which you can visit him, the only recompense you can award to my client. And for those damages, she now appeals to an enlightened, a high mind. A rightful feeling, a conscientious, a dispassionate, a sympathizing, a contemplative jury of a civilized country. First witness, Tracy Tupman. Tracy Tupman? Nathaniel Winkle. Nathaniel Winkle, Nathaniel Winkle. Here, Your Honor. Now, don't look at me, sir. Look at the jury. Now, sir, have the goodness to let his lordship and the jury... Know what your name is, will you? Winkle. What's your Christian name, sir? Nathaniel, sir. Daniel? Any other name? Nathaniel, sir. My lord, I mean. Nathaniel Daniel or Daniel Nathaniel? Uh, no, my lord. Uh, only Nathaniel. Not Daniel at all. What did you tell me it was Daniel for, then, sir? Uh, I didn't, my lord. You did, sir. How could I put Daniel down in my notes unless you told me so, sir? Oh, I, I don't know, Your Honor. You'd better be careful, sir. Now, Mr. Winkle, attend to me, if you please, sir. And let me recommend you, for your own sake, to bear in mind his lordship's injunction to be careful. I believe you are a particular friend of Pickwick, the defendant. Are you not? I I have known Mr. Pickwick now, as well as I recollect at this moment. Pray, Mr. pray, Mr. Winkle, do not evade the question. Are you or are you not a particular friend of the defendant? I, 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 I just about... Will you or will you not? Answer the question, sir. If you don't answer the question, you'll be committed, sir. Come, sir. Yes or no, if you please. Uh, yes, I am. Yes, you are. Why couldn't you say so at once, sir? Perhaps you know the plaintiff, too, eh, Mr. Winkle? I don't know her. I have seen her. Oh, you don't know her, but you've seen her. Now have the goodness to tell the gentleman of the jury what you mean by that, Mr. Winkle. I, I mean that I am not intimate with her. But I have seen her when, when I went to call on Mr. Pickwick in Goswell Street. Pray, Mr. Winkle, do you remember calling on the defendant Pickwick at these apartments in the plaintiff's house in Goswell Street on one particular morning in the month of August last? Uh, yes, I do. Were you accompanied on that occasion by a friend of the name of Tupman and another by the name of Snodgrass? Uh, yes, I was. Are they here? Uh, yes, they are. Pray attend to me, Mr. Winkle, never mind your friends. Now, sir, 
Tell the gentlemen of the jury what you saw on entering the defendant's room on this particular morning. Come out with it, sir. We must tell it sooner or later. It's, uh, the defendant, Mr. Pickwick, was holding the plaintiff in his arms with his hands clasping her waist, and, and the plaintiff appeared to have fainted away. Did you hear the defendant say anything? Uh, I heard him call Mrs. Bardell a good creature, and I heard him ask her to compose herself. For what a situation it was if anybody should come, or, or, or words to that effect. Now, Mr. Winkle, I have only one more question to ask you, and I beg you to bear in mind his lordship's caution. Will you undertake to swear that Pickwick, the defendant, did not say on the occasion in question, My dear Mrs. Bartle, you're a good creature. Compose yourself to this situation, for to this situation you must come, or words to that effect. I, I didn't understand him so, certainly. I, I was on the staircase and couldn't hear distinctly. The impression on my mind... The gentlemen of the jury, what? None of the impressions on your mind, Mr. Winkle, which I fear would be of little service to honest, straightforward men. You were on the staircase and didn't distinctly hear, but you will not swear that Pickwick did not make use of the expressions I've quoted. Do I understand that? Uh, no, I will not. That is all, Your Honor. Call Samuel Willis. Samuel Willis! Samuel Willis! Witness. Yes, me lord? What's your name, sir? Sam Weller, me lord. You spell it with a V or a W? It depends upon the taste and fancy of the speller, me lord. I never had occasion to spell it more than once or twice in my life. But I spells it with a V. Quite right, too, Sammy Willis. Quite right. Put it down a V, me lord. Put it down a V. <laughs> <laughs> Who is that? Who dares to address the court? Usher! Usher! Yes, my lord. Bring that person here instantly. Yes, my lord. Witness! Do you know who that was? <laughs> I rather suspect it was the Alden. Who? The father, me lord. Do you see him here now? No, I don't, me lord. If you could have pointed him out, I would have committed him instantly. Sergeant Buzzfuzz, your witness. No, Mr. Willow! No, sir. I believe you are in the service of Mr. Pickwick, the defendant in this case. Speak up, if you please. Mr. Weller! I means to speak up, sir. I am in the service of that there gentleman. And a very good service it is, too. Little to do and plenty to get, I suppose. Oh, quite enough to get, sir. As the soldier said when they ordered him 350 days. You must not tell us what the soldier or any other man said, sir. It's not evidence. Very good, my lord. Do you recollect anything particular happening on the morning when you first engaged by the defendant? Hey, Mr. Weller? Yes, I does, sir. Have the goodness to tell the jury what it was. I had a regular new fit out of crowns that morning, gentlemen of the jury. And that was a very particular and uncommon circumstance with me in them days. <laughs> <laughs> you had better be careful, sir. So Mr. Pickwick said at the time, my lord. And I was very careful of that there suit of crows. Very careful indeed, my lord. Do you mean to tell me, Mr. Weller... That you saw nothing of this fainting on the part of the plaintiff in the arms of the defendant, which you have heard described by the witnesses? Certainly not. I was in the passage till they called me up, and then the old lady wasn't there. Now attend, Mr. Waller. You were in the passage, and yet saw nothing of what was going forward. Have you a pair of eyes, Mr. Weller? Yes, I have a pair of eyes, and that's just it. If they were a pair of patent double million magnifying gas microscopes of extra power, perhaps I might be able to see through a flight of stairs and a deal door. But being only high, you see, my vision's limited. <laughs> now, Mr. Weller, I'll ask you a question on another point, if you please. If you please, sir. Do you remember going up to Mrs. Bardell's house one night in August last? Oh, yes, very well. Oh, you do remember that, Mr. Weller. I thought we should get at something at last. I rather thought that too, sir. Well, I suppose you went up to have a little talk about this trial, eh, Mr. Weller? I went up to pay the rent. But we did get a talking about the trial. Oh, oh, oh. You did get a talking about the trial. Now, what passed about the trial? Will you have the goodness to tell us, Mr. Weller? We've all the pleasure in life, sir. After a few unimportant observations from the two virtuous females as was there, the ladies get into a very great state of admiration at the horrible conduct of Mr. Johnson and Fogg. 
Them two gentlemen as he's sitting near you now. The attorneys for the plaintiff, my lord. Well, they spoke in high praise of the honorable conduct of Messrs. Dodson and Fogg, the attorneys for the plaintiff, did they? Oh, yes. They said what a very generous thing it was of them to have taken up the case on spec and to charge nothing at all for costs. Unless they got him out of Mr. Pickwick. My lord, my lord, my lord, it's perfectly useless attempting to get any evidence through the impenetrable stupidity of this witness. Uh, I will not trouble the court by asking him any more questions. Stand down, sir. Would any other gentleman like to ask me any... You may go down, sir! Thank you, sir. Good birth, Sammyville. Good birth. After this, Sergeant Stubbin addressed the jury on behalf of the defendant and a very long and very emphatic address he delivered in which he bestowed the highest possible eulogisms on the conduct and character of Mr. Pickwick. Then Mr. Justice Starley uh, summed up in the old established and most approved form. If Mrs. Bartle, the plaintiff, were right, it was perfectly clear that Mr. Pickwick, the defendant, was wrong. And if they thought the evidence of Mrs. Bartle, the plaintiff, worthy of credence, they would believe it. And if they didn't, uh, why they wouldn't. The jury then retired to their private room to talk the matter over, and the judge retired to his private room to refresh himself with a mutton chop and a glass of sherry. A quarter of an hour later, the jury came back. The judge was fetched in. Is that it, judge? Mm -hmm. Gentlemen of the jury, are you all agreed upon your verdict? We are. Do you find for the plaintiff or for the defendant? For the plaintiff. With what damages, gentlemen? Seven hundred and fifty pounds. <laughs> Defendant, have you anything to say? Mr. Pickwick took off his spectacles, carefully wiped the glasses, folded them into his case, and put them into, into his pocket. Then, having drawn on his gloves with great nicety, he rose to his feet. I wish to say, my lord, that not one farthing of costs or damages will you ever get from me. You may try and try and try again, Mrs. Dodson and Fogg, but not one penny will you get if I spend the rest of my existence in a debtor's prison. Yeah! Sad days followed for the Pickwickians. With their leader in jail, the club suffered from internal dissensions. Our meetings were rare and melancholy. And then at last there dawned a glorious day. On November the 4th, 1828... Mr. Pickwick and his servant, Weller, emerged from the fleet. On November the 5th, the members of the Pickwick Club once more gathered together at the feet of their illustrious leader, heard him deliver upon that joyful occasion an oration which has been carefully preserved in the minutes of the society. Gentlemen, cheers. Fellow members, loud cheers. I shall never regret having devoted the greater part of two years to mixing with different varieties and shades of human character. Frivolous as my pursuit of novelty may have appeared to many. Cries of no. Nearly the whole of my previous life having been devoted to business and the pursuit of wealth. Numerous scenes of which I had no previous conception have dawned upon me. I hope to the enlargement of my mind and the improvement of my understanding. Cheers. If I have done but little good, I trust I have done less harm and that none of my adventures will be other than a source of amusing and pleasant recollection to me in the decline of life. God bless all. Loud and prolonged cheering. Tonight, the Columbia Broadcasting System and its affiliated stations have brought you a Mercury Theater on the Air production of The Pickwick Papers by Charles Dickens. The adaptation for radio was made by Orson Welles, who also directed the entire production. This has been the 20th in the weekly CBS series featuring this brilliant Broadway company in dramatized narratives from the world's great literature. In the cast tonight was Samuel Pickwick. Played by that unstarred star of the Mercury Theater on the Air, Mr. Ray Collins. Augustus Stondgrass by Mr. Alfred Shirley. 
Mr. Tracy Tupman, he of the excruciatingly warm heart, and Mr. Frank Reddick. Nathaniel Winkle, the huntsman, Mr. William Podmore, Mr. Wardle, Mr. William Pringle, Joe, the fat boy who always slept with Elliot Reed, Rachel, Rachel, the spinster sister of Mr. Wardle, was Mary Wicks, Sam Weller was Mr. Eustace Wyatt, Mrs. Bardall, Brenda Forbes, Mr. Fogg, Gregor Gibbs, Sergeant Snubbins, Edgar Berrier, and finally, Sergeant Buzzfuzz and Mr. Jingle, whom you probably recognize. The orchestra was directed by Bernard Herman, and Davidson Taylor supervised the production for CBS. <laughs> invite you to be with us next Sunday at 8 o'clock Eastern Standard Time for Orson Welles and the Mercury Theater on the Air. Dan Seymour speaking. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.